Hello and welcome back to a new session from the teaching series entitled The Glory of Righteousness. Today we'll talk about confession of sins in 1 John 1.9. We are still in the first big chapter of this series of teaching entitled Confession of Sins and in this session we will talk about confession of sins in 1 John 1.9. Let's first read this passage in its context from 1 John 1.5 to 1 John 2 verse 1. This is the message we, we have, which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we haven't sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The question we should ask ourselves about 1 John 1, 9 is this. Is this verse speaking to believers or to unbelievers? In the context of everything we've seen so far, this passage cannot be addressed to believers in Christ. If it's speaking to believers, then it undermines the gospel. If all your past, present, and future sins have been forgiven, there is nothing else to forgive. If you became righteous at the moment of salvation, then there is no more unrighteousness to be cleansed of, right? You cannot say in the same time both that you have been cleansed of all sin and that you are still being cleansed. When Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, he said to Peter in, in John 13 verse 10, this Jesus said to him he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean and you are clean but not all of you based on this verse many Christians wrongly conclude that as born again believers they are completely washed and clean in a sense but they still need to wash their feet by asking for forgiveness for the sins they still do such a conclusion is inconsistent with what Jesus did on the cross and it has nothing to do with the context of the washing of feet, which was servanthood to each other. Now coming back to 1 John 1.9, this scripture was written to a congregation of believers, but it was meant for unbelievers and we will see why. We see this kind of address in the epistle of, of Romans as well, which was written mainly to believers. However, we find Romans 10 verse 9 to 10 addressing the unbelievers who might have been in the church among believers and tells them how to be saved. Moreover, in our churches today, preachers usually use this expression, brothers and sisters, to address the congregation. But not all in the congregation may be true brothers and sisters. Some can be just nominal Christians, while others can be unbelievers altogether. In the same way, especially the first chapter of 1 John was written to believers, but it addresses a certain context and a certain issue of the day and that, that was happening among unbelievers, and that was Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge or insight. We know from church history that near the end of the first century and in the early second century after Christ, proto-gnosticism, proto specifically docetism, arose within the church. Docetism was the doctrine that Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh, that he didn't have a physical body, and that therefore his sufferings were only apparent. In later years, this developed into a theological system known as Gnosticism. By the middle of the second century, this philosophy blossomed into full expression and its advocates were producing now their own gospels and epistles, of which the Gospel of Thomas and Gospel of Judas are some examples. 
John appears to have anticipated Gnosticism a development, development and threat to the health of the church, and he wrote 1 John to counteract its influence. Gnosticism blended Greek dualism with Eastern mysticism, and it adopted the dualistic view that only the non-material or the spiritual was good while anything material was evil. Along with this came Eastern mysticism focus, a secret spiritual knowledge reserved only for the chosen few. The Gnostics were trying to fellowship with believers in the church, and that's how their ideas and thoughts infiltrated Christianity. They were saying things like the following. It's great that you are a Christian. It's great that you are acquainted with Jesus Christ. But now, let me lead you into a deeper knowledge of some deep spiritual truths that will secretly unlock more meaning and purpose for you. As I already mentioned briefly, two primary beliefs marked the Gnostics concerning Christ and Christianity. And these were what John was concerned about. First, Gnostics didn't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh or having a physical body. Second, they didn't believe that sin was real or actual at the spiritual level. So they were ultimately sin deniers or deniers of the sin nature transmitted from Adam to all people at the spirit, at the spirit level. Here's why they reasoned that sin was not real in the human spirit. Gnostics believe that any sort of sins or appetites, be it sexual sins or other addictions, occurred only in the physical world. However, they thought they were living at a spiritual level and not a physical one because of the secret deeper knowledge they possessed. As such, anything that happened in the physical realm was less important and it was even considered a fabrication of reality, an illusion, because reality happened at the spiritual level where sin didn't exist, according to them. That is why Gnostics believed that Jesus didn't have a physical body. It would have been too low, too base for Jesus to be tied to a physical body, so Jesus had to be purely spiritual. Therefore, the uncharacteristic opening of the first chapter of 1 John shows clearly that the initial address was not meant for believers but for Gnostics who didn't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. There was no greeting to believers, unlike what we find in his second and third epistles. Instead, the Apostle John opens up his first epistle with a direct address to the serious heresy of Gnostics. Read it. Let's read it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Later in chapter 4, John mentions that anyone who does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God and has the spirit of Antichrist, again counteracting the Gnostic heresy. 1 John 4, 1-3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in, has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. John emphasizes that Jesus had indeed come in the flesh because John himself and his fellow disciples had heard, seen, and touched Jesus. Why was it so vitally important the fact that Jesus came in the flesh? Why any spirit confessing the opposite was called the spirit of Antichrist? Because if Jesus hadn't had a physical body, then he wouldn't have been a real son of man. And if he hadn't been a fully a man, then he could not have identified with humans and pay the penalty of their sins. And ultimately, he would not have been the Christ, the Messiah. Denying Jesus' physical body was the same thing as denying him as Christ, the Messiah. Then in verse 9 of chapter 1, John attacks the second heresy of Gnosticism, the sin denial, and attempts to compel the Gnostics 
to acknowledge and confess their sins so that God would forgive them and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. It's only in chapter 2 of John's first epistle that we see the phrase, my little children, for the first time, implying that from that chapter onwards, the apostle John will be addressing believers. Now let's go through each verse of the context of 1 John 1, 9 and explain it. 1 John 1, 5 says that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. There are only two realms or kingdom in which people, kingdoms in which people can be located. In the light, the saved, or in the darkness, in darkness or the lost. The following verse says that if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. The Gnostics were great at claiming that they were also saved, but in reality, they were still in the realm of darkness because of their wrong beliefs. They were lying both to themselves and others without even being aware of that and were not living the truth. Consequently, in verse 7, John tells them, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Many Christians interpret walking in the light as walking according to the light or up to the light in terms of morality. However, this verse doesn't talk here about the light in terms of moral behavior and deeds, but in terms of which realm people are walking and living in or in terms of the nature of their spirit. It's not so much about how they are walking, but where are they walking? They cannot go in and out of the light. Let's read a few passages explaining these two realms. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. And 2 Corinthians 6.14-15. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Many believers think that light means knowledge and information about the law, the moral law or the Ten Commandments more specifically. And that walking in light means that they have to live and walk according to the level of knowledge and revelation that they have from the law. In other words, walking in the light to them means simply living a moral life. However, if we were to understand the meaning of light in verse 7 as how to live, meaning our behavior, then we as believers should live according to the light in the same way as God himself lives according to the light. Light, and that is how? Perfectly, right? Are we fully living according to the light as God lives according to the light? Of course not. So the light doesn't refer, refer to behavior, but to a nature, to a realm. Moreover, again, if we understand walking in the light in terms of behavior and of how to live, then verse 7 would read as follows. As long as we don't sin, meaning we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. What does the blood of Jesus cleanses us from if we don't walk in sin anymore already? The truth is that we, even as genuine believers, may still perform sinful deeds in our body and soul, but because of our new spirit nature, we will never walk in the realm of darkness again. Going to a McDonald's doesn't make uh, a person into a Big Mac, as well as going to a garage doesn't make a person into a car, right? The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin the moment we enter the realm of light. As verse 7 concludes, even though we still do sinful actions after we were cleansed. At the moment of salvation, the blood of Christ cleanses both the sin at the spirit, uh, the spirit level and all the sinful deeds done in time, in, pa in the past, in the present and future, at the soul and body level. Believers never experience a time during day or night when they are not clean from all sin. 
Sin doesn't cause the saints' fellowship with God to be broken either. God is not waiting for you to restore your relationship with Him after you sinned because it was never broken to begin with. We think our fellowship with the Father breaks when we commit a sin because the whole world around us functions that way. For example, whenever spouses make mistakes and hurt each other, they don't immediately get a divorce. But those mistakes affect the fellowship between the two and the person responsible needs to ask for forgiveness for that fellowship to be restored, right? And then we transfer this way of thinking in our relationship with God and we believe that God is like humans waiting for our apology before he can forgive us and fellowship with us again. But God is not like humans. He took the initiative of paying for our sins through his son's sacrifice even before we were born or existed. From God's point of view, we never come out of fellowship with him. Only our mind and conscience tells us that we are out of fellowship with him if we sin. And we feel like we need to do something to rectify that. Yes, it's true, we may grieve the Holy Spirit as Ephesians 4.30 shows us and frustrate the grace of God, but he never interrupts his fellowship with us. Let's suppose for a moment that you would come out of fellowship with God when you sin. How would that state look like? Let's try to define it together. Does that mean that God is so upset with you and me that he will not help you with anything even if you ask him in prayer, unless you confess your sin? Does that mean that you cannot rely on God for anything and that you are on your own until you confess your sins? No, of course not. Oh, the devil loves it when you think that way, and that is actually his purpose in condemning you. To think that God is angry with you because of your sin and that you should not even dare to talk to him or ask him for anything. That is a completely wrong and unbiblical thinking in the New Testament. That was true only in the Old Testament because people would experience defeat and calamities when they sinned against God. It's true. But that was happening because Jesus Christ had not paid yet the penalty of their sins. For Israelites to experience the blessings of God on a regular basis, they had, they had a way. They had to either always obey the law, which they couldn't most of the times, or bring animal sacrifices and ask for forgiveness immediately when they sinned. That is no longer true in the New Testament thanks to the eternal sacrifice of Jesus that forgives us once and for all. As I mentioned before, in other places, grieving the Holy Spirit is not the same as offending or upsetting Him. The Holy Spirit would be offended and upset if either there was no love and care for believers on His part, or there was no blood sacrifice to atone for those who believe. Grief refers to, to a suffering and a pain caused by love. The Holy Spirit grieves because He loves you and He suffers seeing you how you destroy yourself and allow death to manifest in your life through sin. The word confess from 1 John 1.9 is the Greek word homologeo, which means to say the same thing as someone else, to agree with someone or to acknowledge. Therefore, to confess your sin is to say the same thing about your sins as God does. That sin is real, but that your sins have been forgiven and washed away by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.5 When we realize that we sinned and that actually we were born in sin and rebellion to God because of the Adamic sin, true confession is agreeing with God's word and expressing our gratefulness to Him for the reality of our forgiveness in Christ. Based on this verse, many Christian churches teach that those who already believed in Christ must confess their sins on a regular basis to be forgiven. They teach that believers can go in and out of fellowship with God as mentioned before. They say believers must keep short accounts with God. The reason for short accounts is so they would not forget the sins they committed and thus not be out of fellowship with God for an extended period of time. If this verse indeed talks about confessing sins on a regular basis, 
then it must refer to all sins, right? Both known and unknown. Because the verse doesn't say to confess only known sins. And there is no other verse in the Bible that would say that. Every sin needs to be recognized and confessed. Otherwise, based on this verse, we are still unrighteous. We cannot pick and choose only what we want to confess and confess only the sins we remember. It's not humanly possible to confess every sin in thought and word and deed. Can we know and remember always every single sin and confess it, including the sins of omission? If forgiveness of sins depends on our regular confession of sins, then we have a serious problem to overcome, an impossible one, if I may say so. You may wonder now, what should I do though when I sin? Should I just simply ignore the sin and never say to God that I'm sorry? Not necessarily, but I will explain more about this later in a future session. In the two instances where we see the word sins in 1 John 1, 9, it's the Greek noun hamartia that is used. Two common words are translated from Greek as sin in the New Testament, but have different connotations. The two words are hamartano, a verb, and hamartia, a noun. Both words means, mean literally to miss the mark when shooting an arrow. However, the verb hamartano is used in the Bible in the sense of sinful behavior, a thing that you do from time to time, while the noun hamartia depicts the inward condition that is off the mark and not the actions. According to, a well -known, to the well-known Bible scholar William Vine, the noun hamartia indicates a principle or a source of action, an inward element producing acts, a governing principle or power. In other words, it refers to the sin principle, to our inherited sinful state passed down from Adam after the fall. It's interesting and important to note that Paul uses one of these two words far more predominantly than he uses the other one. Do you know which one it is? In the entirety of his epistles, Paul uses the verb hamartano only 14 times compared to an astounding 55 uses of the noun hamartia. These two words appear the most in the book of Romans, where the ratio is even more astounding. Six uses of the verb hamartano compared to 39 uses of the noun hamartia. Most of the time when we encounter the word sin in the book of Romans, Apostle Paul is not talking about sinful behavior, but about the sin condition. By using the noun form of this word, John, like Paul, was clearly not referring to our committing of individual acts of sin in time, or otherwise he would have used the verb form hamartano. Although he used the plural of, no of the noun hamartia, which would translate into sins, John was referring to the sin nature inherited from Adam at the spirit level together with the totality of sinful actions generated by the nature by that nature at the soul and body level for all time meaning past present and future in light of this i believe we are now in a better position to understand that 1 john 1 9 is not talking about confessing our sins every time we sin in thought or in deed John was speaking about the need to acknowledge and confess to God that we are sinners because of Adam's sin and to receive the total forgiveness for all our sins through Jesus' finished work. How often do we, need, do we need to do this? Only once at salvation, right? That is why 1 John 1.9 is a salvation verse that encourages sinners to acknowledge and confess their sinful state or sinnerhood be born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and have their sinful nature from Adam replaced with a new righteous nature through Christ. Now to be fully convinced that this is what John had in mind, let's take a look at three more passages from the Gospels where the same noun hamartia was used in plural form and analyze its meaning in those contexts. The first one is Matthew 1 verse 21. Let's read it. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Surely Jesus has not saved his people from all sinful actions and deeds in the sense that they don't commit them anymore in time after salvation. 
but from their sins in the sense of the nature inherited from Adam and the sinful actions that are generated from that nature for all time. Luke 24 verse 47 illustrates the same thing in conjunction with repentance. It reflects the same meaning of state or condition. Let's read it. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. The first passage is found in Matthew 3 verses 5 to 6 where it says this. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, to John the Baptist, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. As mentioned previously, it is safe to assume that these people coming to John the Baptist were not confessing to him their individual sins, but their sins in a cumulative sense, cumulative sense. Now, coming back to 1 John 1, 9, the heretical Gnostic doctrine was not acknowledging man's sinful state. John addressed this heresy head on in the first chapter of 1 John, and he was encouraging Gnostics to confess their sinful state and receive the Christ's complete forgiveness and total cleansing from all their, unri all their unrighteousness through his finished work at the cross. Once believers become righteous at the moment of salvation, they cannot have unrighteousness to be cleansed of again. Only unbelievers need to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Then what does Apostle John say about our committing of sins in time at the soul and body level after we have become believers? Just two verses later in the second chapter of the, of the epistle, John answers this question as he begins his address to believers. Let's read 1 John 2 verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. This time the words sin and sins are represented by the Greek verb hamartano. John is now referring to believers committing of sins, their sinful thoughts and deeds. What does John say regarding this? He reminds us that when we fail as believers, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. He is our lawyer employed by the Father himself who represents and defends us against all accusations of the devil. And he is the best lawyer that we could ever have. And he has the best defense. His precious blood that speaks redemptions, redemption for eternity. Because of our Lord Jesus and of what he has accomplished of the cross, we have forgiveness and we stand righteous before God even when we sin. As the Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthian believers who had failed multiple times that they were still the temple of the Holy Spirit, John reminds us of who we are in Christ and of who we have representing us at God's right hand. Then in verse 12 of the same chapter 2, John reinforces what he said in verse 2. Let's read it. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. What does he say here? He reminds spiritual children who still feel condemned that their sins are already forgiven them for his name's sake and not because of their confession. We will conclude here the explanation of 1 John 1, 9 and I hope it brought you more clarity, understanding and peace. And in our next session, we will answer some objections to this one-time confession perspective like the separation wall put by the, our sins from Isaiah 59 verse 2 King Solomon and David's confessions in Proverbs and Psalms, as well as the Lord's Prayer that Jesus uh, uh, taught his disciples. And we will also talk about what should we do though when we sin and how should we approach God. But until then, may God's peace, joy, and favor be with you in everything you do. Amen.